Hello, my name is Jeffrey Suey, and welcome to the Attributes Index Debriefing Guide. Uh, this process will give you a primer uh, or an introduction to what you're about to go through as I or a different coach might debrief your Attributes Index. Now, this uh, particular technology goes by several different names. Attributes Index, sometimes we like to call it the per Personal Talent Skills Inventory, the PTSI for short. Uh, it's also based on a technology called the Hartman Value Profile as well, so feel free to Google all those terms. But uh, there might be a, a variety of different reasons why you're watching this. One could be that I actually am your coach and uh, I'm about to debrief your AI profile and I asked you to go ahead and watch this prior to that time so that you could get ahead, uh, kind of cover all the things I would normally just regurgitate to you anyway, and I have definitely with hundreds of clients over the past 15 years done that, and that just helps us make the most of our time together. Uh, you may be working with a coach that actually went through a Master Coach University training and uh, you are their client and they are going to debrief this with you and they said, hey, you should go watch this prior to actually going through the live debrief with me. And that's great if that's the case. And I'm honored to actually kind of partner with them on uh, the support that they're going to give you here to give you, again, this little primer. The final reason you might be watching this is because you're a coach and you want to get deeper into the theory and understanding of uh, the Attributes Index, Hartman Value Profile, or you really want to get a sense of how you might actually debrief this uh, particular technology with your client, and that's great if that's the case. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started and talk about the Attributes Index. So I want to get I want to give you a couple points first. The first one is that every time that we go over one of your assessment results, uh, it's really important to clarify, first and foremost, what are we measuring here? You know, because you get these graphs and you get the, you know, this, this big chunk of uh, information to read and it's telling you all these things about you. And uh, I think one of the biggest problems that people have around this is they, they have mistakes and misconceptions about what the information in a report or in a particular assessment actually means because they start to think that it's trying to measure something about them that it actually can't possibly measure. So, and also I want you to really have a precise understanding of what exactly are they telling me here uh, because you know what's being measured rather than uh, something else uh, as well. So just for accuracy sake, I want to make sure this is clarified. So. What we're measuring in the Attributes Index is your thinking. We literally are measuring how you think. And uh, I think that's super important, as you might imagine, but I, I think that your thinking, like how you actually think about things in your own mind, it can override everything. Uh, and I, th I think that's why it's important for us to know how you think, for your coach to know how you think, for you to know how you think, because if you understand where your thinking is going, uh, how you think, uh, kind of at what level you're thinking in various dimensions, then you can change it. I mean, it is possible to change your thinking, at least moment to moment. And especially when you're aware of particular patterns of thinking, when you can change the pattern, not just a momentary, like an accidental or a, an exception that proves the rule in terms of how you think, but when you actually change your entire pattern of thinking, then your thinking can override your natural behaviors, it can override even your, your current emotions, it can override your life. I mean, your thinking really in a lot of ways not only determines how you feel, but it determines what you're going to do and what you'll decide, what you'll even focus on, what you'll even know to look at. And so ultimately, you know, if you change your thinking, change the patterns of thinking, the habitual patterns of thinking, you can change your life. So that's pretty important, and that's what we're measuring here. So how do we measure it? So as I says here, thinking overrides everything. It's prepared that for, for making that particular point. But uh, let's talk about where we go in this assessment and specifically how we measure how you think. So first of all, we're measuring your thinking in two worlds. Uh, imagine that your life consists of two different worlds. 
The first world is the inner world. It's not really in any particular order, but there is the inner world, right? The, the, the world of your heart and your mind and what goes on inside of you, the world of yourself, if you will. Like, because you're living your life, you have to live it through that inner world. You can't get outside of yourself. You have to deal with things outside of yourself, but you're always in you, right? So your inner world really matters because that's your life. Ultimately, your inner world is, in, in a big way, your life. It's inside of you. It's the heart of the matter, if you will. And then there's the second world or the other world, the outer world. So this is where you deal with people, places, uh, things and objects, time, and just dealing with everything that's swirling around you in your business, in your family, in your relationships, in your leisure time, uh, you know, just in, in, in where you are, in the things that you own and, and come across, the forces of nature, right? That's all in the outer world, right? So you got to deal with it and ultimately filter it in the inner world as well but the outer world does exist and we want and a big part of your thinking is actually focused on literally just the outer world so you have thinking you have different worlds that your thinking can focus on and so you can focus on the inner world you can focus on the outer world and how where you're focusing will actually radically alter how you think does that make sense now, we don't discern introvert, extrovert within this particular assessment. You can see that in your DISC profile, let's say, or maybe your, your big five uh, personality profile if you're uh, looking at that with me as well. But depending on where your focus tends to be, let's say you're really an extrovert, well, how you think about your outer world, this is gonna have a huge impact on your actions, your decisions, your behavior, and ultimately, of course, your life as well. What if you're more of an introvert? Well, then the way you think inside yourself is going to probably have an even bigger impact than just thinking about the outer world, even though you will have a particular discriminatory approach to thinking about the outer world as well. Does that make sense? So depending on introvert, extrovert, you know, one of these might have a bigger bearing on the way you operate in your life or feel in your life as well. Then we also have three different ways that we kind of s measure and slice and dice the thinking that we're measuring, okay? So uh, we've got two worlds that, you, that your thinking focuses on, and then you have three d what I call dimensions of thought. Think of these as, like if uh, you remember in, uh, in uh, geometry, you know, that you had the X and Y axis, and then you maybe have the Z axis that takes you out into depth, right? You have height and, and width or whatever, and uh, these were different. Uh, axes or what I might call dimensions as we call this the study of axiology actually uh, where we have an, a, a particular dimension that we can measure on a continuum where you fall right so each of these think of these as like almost like an X Y and Z axis right we can plot you in these different dimensions these different axes kind of where you tend to fall and each of these axes modify how all of the rest of them operate as well. So it really is kind of like plotting a point in space. There's, there, there's several different axes or dimensions through which you need to plot it in order to understand where the entirety of you or your thinking actually falls. Because your thinking is a combination of these three. It's not just one of these three uh, by themselves. You're not just a point on a line. You're a point in space right, in terms of your particular thinking. So we have three, what I call dimensions or axes of thoughts. Another way of thinking about it, if you really want to simplify it, and we'll, we're gonna try to do that here for you so you can really get this kind of uh, clear for yourself. There are like three brains. So think about, imagine, like you obviously we all have one brain, but in our world of axiology, in our world of the attributes index, you know, we actually have three. <laughs> Right, so think about these three different brains that do different things, they kind of function in different ways, and each of them we're gonna measure here so we can add it all up, we can look at these different dimensions and kind of uh, cross-reference them, if you will, see where they intersect and where they don't intersect so we can ultimately have a, kind of an overall algorithm for how you think. Okay, now the guy who actually invented the technology of axiology, 
he combined a tremendous wealth of knowledge around therapeutic modalities and psychotherapy and psychology with uh, uh, null set calculus and uh, uh, you know quantum mechanics stuff that's way over my head and created ultimately a very complex algorithm to look at these different aspects of how you think and kind of add it all up uh, my understanding of the history of this gentleman is that he actually he grew up in Germany and this was at the time that the Nazis were actually coming to power and he fled Germany and the rest of his life having looked at some of the extremes of human experience decided to figure it all out you know he, he de really just devoted his life to understanding what makes life matter what is how what gives life its value and what in the human experience is like wh what's most important what's least important ultimately such that you really have a valuable life you have a life that's really worth something you have an experience of life that's really worth something and so evidently what he came up with was that there's really three different aspects of how we experience life how we reproduce life um, the way that we the way we experience life and you can't experience life if your brain dead right we experience life through our brain representing life representing life to us it's a processor if you will it's like a computer we'll talk about that in a second so um, so this processor has to take in information from the five senses, you know, hearing things, seeing things, feeling things, etc. And then it has to jumble it all up and kind of, you know, come up with what does all this mean and what is the value of my experience, right? Like, how should I feel about this? What should I do, except, uh, etc. So it's a processor. It's like a little, com it's a little computer. Um, and so really think about this brain as a computer. It's like you really have three of them. You have three different computers that do different things with all the information that they're given. Another way I like to look at this is think of it like each of these is a, is a lens through which you see the world. Like I have my glasses, right? If I don't have my glasses on, I mean, I can see light. I can, I can see there's probably a computer screen in front of me and some lights over there, but I can't really tell anything else, right? Like I can't make out very much because my lenses are required to focus the light so that I can make out very specifically what's going on. So when I have these lenses, I can see things clearly, right? I can represent something much more clearly. I can read the words I have on my wall. I can see the lights. I can see outside. I mean, I can see much more detail, right? Uh, if I didn't have any lens, my, my eye had no lens at all. I might see some light, but that's about it. I have no clue what's going on, right? So think about these three processors or these three brains like they're three lenses. They're a lens that focuses uh, everything that comes at you in life to something that you can then digest. Does that make sense? It kind of deconstructs the light into colors and shapes and information and creates a meaning out of it, you know, creates the value of life. If there's no detail in life, if there's nothing to see, then what's the value, right? So that's what this guy was trying to figure out, was trying to figure out where's the value. And he started realizing the value is through how we process life, how we think about life, how we represent life through these different dimensions of thought, and that there's different ways you can evaluate what matters depending on which lens you're using. Because the different brain has a different value system. It has different uh, predilections. It has a different dis uh, discriminatory, uh, discriminatory approach to uh, what it understands, what it focuses on, what it cares about as well. And b all three of these things are like important. They matter. I mean, your brain is set up for these three things, but they're not created completely equal. And so there's a valuation system that he has around this. So I'm going to present these to you briefly, and then we're going to get into much more detail around not only how we measure or how we measure how you think in these dimensions, uh, but we'll also get into these dimensions. I'll explain them to you so you really understand the theory behind this before anybody debriefs this assessment with you and tries to get into the ins and outs of it. So. Uh, I'll just present these to you very briefly and then we'll get into them in more detail in a second. So first dimension is called systemic dimension and think of this as like logic, 
black and white thinking. I think of this like head, like just what's in your head, right? So it's a very kind of computerized uh, brain. Think of this particular brain as being this scholar that just, you know, he's got his book and he just reads the book and it's just like, this is the gospel here. You know, there's nothing but what's in the book. It's very just like emotionless and systematic. That's what we call it, systemic. The extrinsic dimension or the extrinsic lens or extrinsic brain is very different. This is more of the action brain. Uh, think of it as hand rather than head. So you could be in your head and just thinking about stuff or you can take your hand out and actually do something, right? It's actually get a good feel for things and make something happen in action. Uh, and, you know, it's like uh, it could be like the warrior or the carpenter or the merchant or the wizard that's at work. You know, it's like when you just think about something and you're just a scholar just reading about stuff, you're not really producing anything. You're not taking any action. But you, when you get into the world of, uh, of, of war or buying and selling or carpentry or building something, and again, kind of a warrior wizard type, they're in action. They don't just study. They produce something. The wizard casts a spell. The warrior swings the axe or the, or the sword and fights a battle. The merchant buys and sells. Uh, it's like an explorer. They're not just thinking about stuff. They're out there doing stuff. So that's a very, very different dimension, as you can imagine. There's a brain that thinks, and there's a brain that kind of manages actions, if you will. Okay, and then finally, we've got the intrinsic dimension. And the intrinsic dimension, this is uh, where your heart comes out, so to speak. This is like your emotional intelligence. That's why I could say emotion here, right? So you've got the center of your lover, your mother, your heart center of how you can feel yourself and others, right? How you appreciate emotion, your emotional intelligence, your empathy, if you will. So the way we divide these, your, all you're thinking up is head, hand, heart, right? Head, hand, heart. Or another way of saying it is logic, action, and emotion. You've got a logical brain, you've got an action or a, a you know, like a physical brain, if you will, uh, and then you have an emotional brain, right? You can be the scholar, you can be, you know, the merchant or the carpenter or the warrior, or you can be the lover or the mother, right? And each of these is a different, I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of drawing out these archetypes so you can get more of a characterization of these brains because these brains kind of have a, they have kind of a, cartoon of themselves, if you will, in our minds, in the stories that we've learned. And so it's a little bit clearer and easier to appreciate that. Okay, so let's take a look for a second at these three dimensions in more detail. So as I mentioned before, there are three different brains, if you will, that we're measuring, the thinking of. And the first one, as I mentioned before, is the systemic brain. Now, uh, this is an oversimplification, and a lot of the anatomy is not exactly correct, but just it gives you a little bit of a picture that you can use in order to actually kind of appreciate some of the evolution of these different levels of thinking, these different brains. So this systemic brain, as I mentioned before, this is more of the thinker, more of the hyperlogical brain. And there is actually, in your, in your brain, there is a... Uh, the kind of the center of it, right above the brain stem, is this tiny little acorn-sized brain, right? And this little acorn-sized brain just kind of like does very basic binary thinking for you, right? It just gets, gets you up in the morning, keeps your heart pumping. It uh, gives you the basic urges in order to kind of live through your day, has you react to things in more of an automatic way, the way a computer might. This part of your brain doesn't have any feelings or anything. I th that's why I like to call this the reptilian brain. If you ever saw like a lizard or a snake or an alligator react to the world, it's very simplistic. Like it either runs away because it knows there's danger or it attacks because it knows like that must be food. Um, there's no gray area. It's very black and white. It's like if you programmed a computer, you could have it do the same exact thing that that alligator just did, right? And by the way, alligators don't write poetry. They don't cry about the, the animal they just ate. They don't have a feelings about that. Right? They're just like a, like a machine, basically. And so that's this brain, the thinking brain, the hyperlogical brain. It's just a machine that thinks. Now, we have a very advanced set of thinking algorithms that allow us to be 
let's say, unemotional about things and hyper rational about them. Uh, but it all starts here. You know, this is kind of the, the center of that. It's a very powerful part of the brain because it actually not only allows you to go ahead and make a snap judgment, like a binary judgment. Yes, I'm going to do it. No, I'm not. It, it, in fact, in a way, it's the brain that kind of gets you into action because it's the thinking that precedes that action. Does that make sense? So this is where your critical thinking happens, black and white decisions and thinking, action without any emotion. Uh, it's, it's basically just do it or don't do it. Uh, and it's pure logic. Now, part of the problem around pure logic is that you can logically make the right decision, but it ends up being what they like to call a logical fallacy, right? Like, because there's gray areas. There's other judgments that go beyond just how we define things, right? Uh, think of this brain in a way like, uh, like a dictionary full of definitions. Everything is rigid and structured and in fact, they like to call this structured thinking, some of the people who debrief this, because it's like, again, it's just whatever is in the book and anything that's not in the book, book doesn't exist. And so you can't get feelings and emotion and, and what people care about in the book. And this, this, is, this is a bit of a tyrannical thinking process. So for instance, like if we said, well, in this particular, uh, this particular group of people, they judge this religion as evil and so if I'm that religion and they say, well, all these evil people have to die, well, then they're just going to kill me even if like we're friends, <laughs> right? They're not going to make a value judgment about how they feel about me because the tyranny of the systemic brain, the tyranny of the thinking brain, the hyperlogical brain is, it's like, you're not a buddy of mine. You're like some grass that I have to mow. You know, I just need to cut you down because that's the rule, right? So that's the tyranny of this type of thought is that it can end up being too rigid. It can end up uh, missing some, uh, uh, some finesse and some minutia, uh, some, uh, some detail, some of the gray areas, and uh, that could create a real problem. But it's a very powerful part of the brain, something that we all have. And uh, it, again, it's think about it like, you know, the power of you know, a cobra waiting, waiting to strike. It's like they're just, they, they see what they need to do and they do it. They don't think too much about it, right? That's this uh, particular brain. And then also we can get much more advanced as humans with hyperlogical thinking, right? Anytime we're doing advanced math or we're doing, uh, uh, you know, heavy duty uh, science or anything, when the, especially the hard sciences, uh, and we're learning and regurgitating all this knowledge and information and calculus of the, the calculus of putting it all together. That's a big part of this brain, basically. You know, now, and again, as long as it's kind of in black and white terms, this brain is, in, is, is exactly where the, where the calculus is going on. And if you've ever known anyone that's like this, like can they, they live in their head, they don't seem to have a lot of feelings. I mean, not that they don't, but they, they don't seem to like think about them very much. They don't act on them that much. Uh, they are kind of more of a human calculator, if you will. Um, even if they kind of put a mask of emotion over it, you could tell inside it's basically just this cold, calculating mind that's determining what to do and what not to do. That's this brain. And this brain's probably, they probably have a bias for using this part of their mind uh, quite a bit. So hope that makes sense. This is, once again, the sy systemic brain uh, or the systemic dimension of thought. And uh, it has tremendous power for logic for decisions and ultimately to get you started in action uh, to make a black and white, this I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do that. That's where this brain really thrives and that's why you need this brain as well. We'll get into more detail about exactly how you might use this in various worlds like the inner and outer worlds in a couple minutes, but I just first of all wanted to kind of present this to you. Uh, as one more example I'm going to give you around this. When you look at an object, or you think about anything, even a concept, which is ultimately when we think about things, we objectify them, right? Our brain is there to kind of zoom in on certain targets or actions. So they all, everything in our mind, whether it's an action, a concept, or a thing, turns into a thing at the end of the day. So let's simplify this just for uh, lack of, uh, lack of a, a better uh, example. 
I could take like this, uh, this flip chart, for instance, this stand, this tripod, and I could say, well, you know, my systemic brain receives this and calculates that that's what it is. It defines this thing, right? I say, this is a flip chart. It's not my mother. It's not uh, scrambled eggs. It's not my cell phone. It's not me. It's a flip chart. And that's all it is, right? Now, I can't do anything else other than just define it with this brain. I can, I can see the dimensions of it. I can see what it is. But there's no, there's no gray area here, right? There, there's no nuance is what I was looking for before. Uh, around this. This is just, it's either a flip chart or it's not. A flip chart's a flip chart's a flip chart. There's no difference between flip charts. It either is or it ain't a flip chart, right? So it's hyperlogical, it's oversimplified, and it's powerful enough at least to make a black and white determination that that's what this is. And that's all, and ultimately the challenge with this is that I can't exactly do more than flip chart stuff with this flip chart if I'm only thinking from my systemic brain. That's the tyranny of it. It'll only ever be a flip chart, right? And then, and so there's static thinking around this particular dimension, which could be very constraining uh, to you or to the relationships that uh, you might have if this is the only brain that you can use, ultimately. Um, when you look at, like, probably a good example is various uh, various hyper uh, fundamentalist religious contexts will look at certain, uh, they'll examine certain aspects of life in very rigid ways, very static ways, like this is right, this is wrong, and it's never any different. And so they don't, they miss the nuance and they say, if you do this, you're evil, right? If you, you know, it's like, this is the rule book, right? And not every religion is like that, but there are some where we probably can guess that you know, they, at least the fundamentalist sides of those particular or sects of those uh, religions uh, will demonstrate uh, this type of thinking to a T. And some of the actually limitations of this particular type of thinking, there's power in it, but there's also constraint and limitation to it as well. All right, now, if you look beyond that little brain stem and that, that little kind of reptilian brain, which again, evolutionary, evolutionarily speaking, the brain is kind of built in layers. And that centerpiece of the brain that we just talked about, you know, I like to call the reptilian brain. If you look at reptiles, they actually have that little brain. You know, that we share that brain with them, but we got more than that as well. So around that brain, there's a whole bunch of white matter and it's kind of in the center, center of the brain still, but it's a big part of the bulk of the, uh, you know, the size and weight of the brain. And uh, this is actually the brain that we share with mammals. So uh, if you've, uh, what's interesting about the mammalian brain, like uh, what I like to call the mammalian brain, or in this particular dimension, we call this the extrinsic dimension, is this dimension, as I mentioned before, it's all about action. It's all about the hand for it. So this is all the, in the doing of things. Now, if you never noticed a big difference between mammal behavior and let's say reptile behavior is that you know, reptiles are kind of, they're kind of klutzes, if you will. And, you know, they, they, either, they either eat or they run, like I said before. But if you take, you know, these higher level mammals, uh, they seem to have much more nuance in their ability to act. They're masters of doing in a big way. So uh, one of my favorite examples is if you take a pack of wolves, that pack of wolves will hunt prey in a almost like a strategic way and now they're not writing down a plan you know like they're not mapping out how they're going to flush out the prey but somehow they're intuitively know that a couple a couple wolves go to the front and then the rest of the wolves go to the back of the pack of animals that they're trying to flush out and and kind of flank the prey and flush them out and and then they attack all at once and somehow they like they're not thinking about they're not planning this not thinking uh, in the future in fact the extrinsic dimension of thought what we're talking about here is really m it's it lives in the moment right so those those wolves are like they're not thinking about yesterday and they're not projecting to tomorrow right they're not worried about doing the laundry while they're hunting they're just hunting right they're just in that moment right but somehow they have the they have the calculus they have the brain to do it with mastery right and so they can work together as a team 
they can do the right thing at the right time to win the game to actually eat that day ultimately so think of this like the mammalian brain the part of you that can hunt down their prey <laughs> the part of you that's the doer the part of you that has that intuitive ability to make the right decision at the right time at a gut level i'll give you one more example uh there is a some kind of mathematician or a physicist that had a dog and he takes his dog out to uh, the lake right there's this l park with a lake right and so what this physicist liked to do was they liked to take the frisbee and throw it out into the lake and the dog would jump into the lake and run after the frisbee and catch the frisbee and bring it back to uh, bring it back to the, the their owner you know their their master the physicist and so the physicist would do this again and again and again with this frisbee and he suddenly started to notice that the dog would run along the lake and then jump in the water. He wouldn't just jump in the water immediately. He'd run along the edge of the lake for a while until the dog jumped in the water. And this physicist, of course, knew their geometry and their calculus and their angles very well. So when they started watching this dog and noticing that it would time its, its jump into the lake, that, that dog was looking at the Frisbee, where the Frisbee was, how far out it was, the dimensions of the lake. The dog was somehow intuitively calculating when to jump in the water and the physicist started to film this and took pictures of it and brought it back to, I don't know, whatever lab a physicist has, but brought it back to, the, to their calculator, you know, their fancy Hewlett Hewl Packard calculator. And they graphed it out and they realized this dog is doing calculus. This dog always jumps into the water to go after the Frisbee at the exact correct angle to have the shortest swim, the fastest swim to that particular frisbee no matter, no matter how far out it was how much of an angle it was how far ahead it was it knew exactly when to jump in the water and he's like this is like advanced you know calculus and curves and you know all this fancy stuff and he's and he's asking himself like how does this dog do calculus when it took me like 22 years to learn calculus and he started to realize this dog has the brain that does the calculus for the dog, even though the dog can't consciously do the math in the dog's head. The dog is doing calculus even though the dog doesn't know it. And so you can think of the doer brain, the extrinsic brain, the brain of the outside world, working with objects in motion and outside and getting, making the best decisions in the moment, in the now. The mammalian brain, like like the mammals that make the best decisions and they don't even consciously know they're making it. it we talk about it like instinct but they're still doing very advanced calculations to make good decisions or the best decisions for them so that's the expert doer it's the craftsman that you know can hammer the nail just right that can hone the wood just right that can make the best chess move i think of this as like the chess player in you that you know thinks of the best move at the moment to get the bet to get the win right it's the competitive nature of of getting good better best and making a determination as as to which flip chart is the best flip chart like once again looking at the flip chart object now i'm not just saying this is a flip chart and it's not my mother i'm th i'm thinking as an extrinsic thinker i'm thinking this flip chart is a little flimsy it could fall over at any moment you know when i try to when i try to write on this flip chart you know it it kind of bounces around right so i mean it is a flip chart it works as a flip chart but it doesn't work that well i could get a 200 dollars flip chart and it's going to be made of plastic it's going to be really solid i'll be able to write stuff in real time i mean man that'll be good for my live streams right so i can determine and intuit whether or not i'm consciously thinking of it different flip charts for different purposes and how well it'll help me to do what i need to do does that make sense so that's the my mammalian brain that's doing that. I'm calculating, you know, hey, not now, not all flip charts are the creative the same. So now that tyrannical, like fundamentalist uh, religion that judges me because of my religion and I have to die, suddenly they'll say, well, you know, you're actually not such a bad Christian. You know, you don't have to die, <laughs> right? So it's a different way of determining value, right? you can have a systemic determination of value in saying 
you know, this, what it is is what its value is. This is a flip chart. It's the value of a flip chart rather than saying extrinsic valuation is, well, this may be a flip chart, but that's not the only aspect of its value. Its usefulness is part of its value. Its price is part of its value. You know, its impact is part of its value. So if I'm the evil Christian, but I have a good impact on that particular person who's maybe in their systemic mind judging me, they might suddenly decide I have a different value to them, and then suddenly I avoid getting executed, right? So this is a very important brain, as you might imagine, because suddenly now we're valuing usefulness and va making different value judgments than the systemic brain is making. So think of this brain, again, as the brain that makes real-time decisions in three dimensions in space and time to win, uh, like the sport you're playing, uh, to win in moving your body around to the right way and the right, you know, to hit the target, to win in business, let's say, to make, to get, make the most money or in careers, to win in your life, to get the best marriage, to get the best house, to get the best car. You're, you're not just saying, you know, married, car, b you know, career. Like that's a systemic brain. I, do I have, the systemic brain only thinks, do I have a career? Yes or no. <laughs> do I have a, a wife or husband? Yes or no, right? Like anyone will do, right? It's just like, I just got to get one. <laughs> and then I'm good because that's what the value of that is. It is what it is. But now I can say, what is, who is the best wife for me, right? Who is the, what is the best career for me? What is the best uh, uh way of use my time today for me, right? I can make more nuanced judgments around usefulness using this extrinsic brain. It's highly valuable. You use this in business and career and practical decisions. We really call, like to call this a practical brain as well. So that's why it says here, decision-making, practicality, uh, result strategy, like what's the strategy they're going to use to get to the result? Your, this part of your brain is what determines that. Situational awareness, like the wolf, again, like noticing what's going on, on around it. You get a lizard, doesn't really understand that there's food, but then there's danger and it's going to do one or the other. The wolf, you know, in, the, in a situation where that might confuse the lizard, you know, where there's food and the lizard wants the food, but then there's like a predator and the lizard should really run away from the, the cat or the dog or something. That lizard will make a black and white judgment. I'm, it's time to run and they'll miss out on the food or it's time to eat and then they get eaten right? But if you put a, ma a mammal in that situation, like you put a wolf or a lion or, you know, even a, a house cat in that situation, there's food right there, but then there's like the dog is right there or there's danger right there. That cat will figure out how to get around the dog and get to the food and then get back around the dog so the cat can have its cake and eat it too, you know, have its food and, and get away from the dog basically. So very advanced calculus is happening here to make situational decisions based on all the dimensions of what's happening in the external world, the extrinsic world. Does that make sense? So that's why I said here, situational awareness. You can see all of the things around you and then make an overall kind of like action plan. I'm not saying cats plan things out. They probably don't, but they certainly act like they do, <laughs> right? Even though they're living in them now, they can somehow get around things. And, uh, and make the right decisions for, to get through everything. That's situational awareness. Uh, you can also call this momentary intuition. It's like, I, in this moment, I intuit that I have to make this decision in this moment, right? And so you're living in the now, making a decision to get the best result. That's the extrinsic dimension of thought. So once again, I look at my flip chart, I can now make better value judgments about this flip chart beyond that it's just a flip chart and I can use this flip chart to its best, uh, to its highest and best use to get the most out of it and actually, you know, kind of partner with my flip chart in a really positive way. Uh, all right, let's move on to this final dimension of thought, which we call intrinsic. And this is the part that you might consider is, you know, almost purely left to humans because if you look at, and again, we have kind of a brain stem that we have the mammalian brain. It kind of goes around that, which we just talked about, kind of the usefulness of that part of the mind. Uh, but outside of all of it, this part that's very, very wrinkled, is uh, the cerebral cortex. 
and also for humans the neocortex which is the kind of the frontal lobe and this part of the brain as as we've all noticed is very wrinkled because it's actually larger than our brain case it's larger than our skull and in order to fit all that surface area into our little heads we got to cram it all in there and it gets all wrinkly you know you're kind of folding it up that's the folds of the brain so you know if you took your brain out of your head which you shouldn't do don't try that at home and you stretched it out like a disc it would be like a foot or more in diameter foot and a half in diameter or so right so it's actually quite an amazing kind of like appendage that we have and it's grown and grown and grown evolutionary speaking evolutionarily speaking if you believe that um, uh, you know uh, beyond the uh, functionality and the anatomy of uh, you know our predecessors if you will like the great apes and uh, obviously lower level mammals as well this part of the brain does some amazing things it does have logic centers so obviously systemic thinking is is also uh, supported through this part of the brain but also this is the part where we have intuition where we can think into the future and uh, like simulate actions into the future and truly plan things this is our area of memory as well where we can upload different ideas and different things that have happened in the past and then intuit it into the future and project it onto the future as to what might happen as a result this is the most advanced part of our brain by far and it's really a big part of what makes us human as well so this part of the brain does a lot of things but one aspect of it is really what is required for this intrinsic dimension that I'm describing to you now this is the part of the brain that relates to other people that relates to yourself this is a part that empathizes and feels as well uh, this is the part of your brain that can write a poem that can kind of feel for someone else and empathize this is the part of your brain that has emotional intelligence or lack thereof so you might feel emotions in a variety of different parts of the brain but this is the part that understands it this is where true relationship relating and understanding comes from as humans at least at least in the advanced way that we can actually have that relationship happen to us uh, as as humans uh, so this is where emotion is feelings and relating and understanding those things empathy sensitivity it's all here so we go back to our flip chart now this is not just a flip chart or not as a systemic brain would think this is not just a useful or not so useful flip chart this is a flip chart that like you know this is really the only flip chart I've ever had in my business I bought it you know more than 15 years ago actually believe it or not I don't know if I got I don't think I got a new one I think this is the one I started with and uh, I use this flip chart in you know my first uh, seminars that I ran you know 15 17 20 years ago and uh, so I have a real hi history with this guy and uh, you know I know how it works and I know its ins and outs I know its limitations as a good extrinsic thinker but there's something about this flip chart that has a history with me there's a soul of the flip chart there's the feelings I have for the flip chart the intrinsic qualities my intrinsic value of this flip chart now I don't value this so much that I'm gonna keep it forever I could throw it away that's okay but you can imagine certain objects like when my father passed away uh, we went to gather his belongings really what had any value to us that that remained and he really didn't have anything of uh, of any great financial value when he died but uh, he had his boots and I remember he had like a few things from his college days uh, from his fraternity days that he'd shared with me at like a clock and a watch and and you know one of those like paddles that they use you know to like torture each other in fraternities and you know I had a few other things some pictures things like that and I kind of gathered this stuff up and I you know I brought it home and I put it in my closet and every once in a while I open my closet and I look at those boots and I feel my father you know it's like I I think about him and who he was and I empathize with him and I feel I know he's kind of gone physically but he's still there right he's still there for me in those boots so those boots I mean could I sell the boots could I throw them away I mean I could but there'd probably be some feelings about that right it wouldn't just be like oh it's what if it's a pair of boots right 
It's not like a boot pair of boots at the store. They're boots. They're not sandals. They're boots, right? Or they're boots, but they're too big for me, like the way an extrinsic thinker would think about it. They're it's like, no, those are my father's boots. It's like the soul of my father in those boots, right? So there's feelings that I have about those boots that I wouldn't have for other shoes or the boots. Does that make sense? That's a way of valuing the world. Again, remember that this, this guy who invented axiology, where he started with this was what is value? What is quality of life? What is, where is the value in life, right? You came from Germany where there was very little value for certain lives at the time, right? And he wanted to understand. He really wanted to know what's value well, there's three different values that we have. There's what something is, systemic value. There's what it does, which is the usefulness, right? Extrinsic value. And then there's how it feels, if you will. Think of it that way. Like what it represents in a way, like the poetry of it, right? Is what it, what it, how it feels, if you will, or how we experience that, let's say. So the value of this flip chart is it's a flip chart but it's also a useful item for me, but it's also it's part of my history. Systemic, extrinsic, intrinsic. This has all three values. If I looked at my father's boots and I said, well, they're boots and it's not a, you know, a, a, a grilled cheese sandwich, fine. It's the value of what a boot, it is what, it, uh, boots are boots are boots, right? Systemic value. I can say, you know what? I could probably wear those boots in a pinch to get through the snow. They're a little big for me, but you know, they could be useful. They could be useful, right? I could use them for already. I might, I could sell them and make a little bit of money, right? So that they, they have, they have use value, utility value, extrinsic value, extrinsic valuation of the boots. But I wouldn't get rid of those boots because that's the history of my family in those boots. I have very few things for my father that are actual objects that I can hold on to that like I should like put those up on a mantle or something and say those are my father's boots you know with pride right with with a tear in my eye and so there's extrinsic I can value those boots in three different dimensions and that's what you do with the world you evaluate decide focus feel and experience lull of life through those three different dimensions those three lenses and we put them all together so those are the dimensions that we're, if you will, measuring. Let's come back to what I was about to share, which was how do we measure those dimensions? If, we, if those three dimensions are the thoughts that we're measuring, what are the aspects of those thoughts that we measure? And there's two of them that we're measuring. There's two, think of them as, uh, uh, as kind of areas that we score, if you will. Uh, the first one is clarity. So clarity gives us a sense of how clearly do you think with that dimension because i can be really clear as to what this is and what it's not i could be or i could not be not so clear i could be really clear as to how useful this is or and where how it's not useful i could be very clear as to how i feel about this right or how other people feel about it let's say right and in fact it's interesting we're talking about the feelings there are different factions in our society right now that some of them really highly value the intrinsic value of things. And so they say, even if you say something that might be true, if it feels bad to us, you shouldn't say that, or you shouldn't deal, you shouldn't identify that attribute, that value, if you will. That faction is like, look, if it doesn't feel good, it's not okay, right? There's another faction in our society that you may have noticed that they value things for their usefulness and their what they really are and so what they'll say is that's what that really is and then of course the other faction feels really bad about that so then they all you know kind of get mad at each other for valuing different things that we actually all value just at different amounts so the clarity is how clear are you in a particular dimension right and so you can have crystal clear clarity where it's like you could see everything because you have the perfect prescription glass, you have the perfect microscope, the perfect telescope, perfect lens, perfect processing machine to understand what's going on with that particular dimension. Or maybe you're a little blurry, right? Like you could see the light, you can make out some objects, but you can't really see a lot. You can see a little bit, but not a lot. 
right? It's not that you can't see anything. It's just like your lens is a little foggy there. It's not exactly in focus or your processor just really doesn't have the speed to be able to crunch all the numbers for you. So if you have a lower resolution picture or are you just totally freaking blind, right? Like, is it just like, I can't see a thing in that dimension. I don't know what things are, or I don't know how useful this is or not, or I don't know how I feel about it or how other people feel about it. I don't, I don't know, right? Or I totally know. This is how people feel. This is how I feel. This is what it is. This is what it's not. This is how it's used. This is how it's not used, all right? So are you crystal clear? Are you blurry? Or are you blind? And then second, like, and this is just, a, and again, this is all kind of the same area, but just I want you to think a bit about this in different ways before we go over it. Your vision, your clarity of vision, do you have a wide angle lens where you can see everything? You can see the whole world in that particular dimension? Or are you a little bit more myopic? Like, are you more narrowly, you have a narrower view? By the way, which one is better, a wide view or a narrow view? Which one of these are better? Now you might say a wide view, but guess what? Wide view is very useful for some applications, but actually a narrow view can be more useful for certain applications. For in, I'll just give you one example. Um, let's take an intrinsic dimension. If you had a wide view of emotion in the world, Let's say you are a, uh, an, a, 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 a sculptor and you make huge installations for cities, like big, you know, 20 foot tall sculptures, right? And you have a wide view of the emotions of the world, the poetry of life, right? So you can see all of it. You can see the good and the bad. You can see the, the ups and the downs. You can see the, the, all the different feelings that people have. And you create a sculpture for a city that is like shows really hellish things and shows really good things and shows really bad things and shows all of them. And it's just kind of like this mishmash of everything, right? There are paintings that we see like that where you could see like, it's like a map of the world, right? Now, one thing that happens with most of that art is it's not appreciated very much because it shows too much. It shows it all. And, you know, art is not about channeling everything. Art is about channeling something in a way that represents the intrinsic value of it, right? I mean, because if, if it doesn't have any intrinsic value, it's probably not art, right? So I can show every moment in my father's uh, life in a, uh, I don't know, like a montage or something. That's got to be very artistic. Or I can zoom in. I can have a narrow myopic view and just show his boots, right? And that, like if I had two competing pieces of art, I have, you know, my father's entire life and the whole movie of his life and everything he's ever done and a big collage and every, you know, everything's little thumbnails and they all arrows to which, you know, like how he went through all of that stuff. It might be interesting. Or I could just frame up his boots and just put them up there. And it's like father's boots, right? The father's boots are, would win. <laughs> I could probably see that. Because people know that narrower view takes a slice, zooms in on it, and appreciates it at a different level. Even though it is myopic, even though it is not a whole view. You take certain artists... They only show the negative, right? They only show the, 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 the hatred. They only show the pain. They only show the sorrow in their art. And then others only, you know, show really joyous things and everything's just freely and lovely. But they don't show at all, right? Those individuals, at least on an intrinsic level, are probably kind of myopic, at least in their art. They might be wide view and then they chose to narrow it. But if you have a narrower view and that's just maybe a little bit more blurry about a lot of things, you can only see one or two little things at a time. You know, that could actually, the creativity-wise and artistic representation actually, really, that might be very useful. It may not be useful with, like, connecting with a variety of people, <laughs> right? Or appreciating the wide range of emotions that you go through on a regular basis. But this could be as useful as this, depending on the output. I hope that makes sense. So there's no, like, better or worse here. There's just how it f plays out in somebody's life and what the, uh, what the impact of that is. So another way of looking at this is like, not just wide or narrow view, how much can you see, but 
the aperture on like a camera. The aperture lets in more or less light. So if you have a really wide aperture and you let in all the light, it, you could you go blind. It could be too much, right? It's like drinking from a fire hose. You're like, oh no, I don't know what to focus on. You could get confused. You could get lost in that. But when you narrow that aperture and there's less light, it's darker. You may not be able to see as much, but you gotta you gotta narrow that down to a point where it's something that you can take. Now, by the way, other people have such darkness, they have a pinpoint, they could barely see any light at all, that could create problems as well, right? So this is what we call clarity. Think of this as an uh, oversimplification would be that uh, it's like your, your situational intelligence, like how smart are you about certain things? Your level of understanding of a particular dimension, or your, at least your ability to understand. So that's the first area that we're measuring. Second area we're measuring is bias. What we call bias, like what biases do you have? Now this is, by the way, where our inventor came up with what is the value of life? What is the value of life experience? What is, how do you value experience of life? Because there, yes, there are three different ways you can value it, but they're not all created equal. And so people have their own values of those three dimensions, and they're not always aligned with the order that is ideal. Okay, so there is an ideal order for the three dimensions, for uh, systemic, extrinsic, and intrinsic. And on top is intrinsic, actually. It's the feelings of life. Like, if, if you don't feel good, like, n nothing else really is going to really matter that much in life, right? That's literally life. Underneath that is the usefulness. It's like, it really still kind of matters how useful something is. If you just feel and feel and feel and there's no use in it, you might stop feeling good after a while because you need to eat and pay your bills and stuff like that. And then after that, the final lowest value is what things, you know, how to define them, what they are, the logic of it, because the logic is not very useful in the moment usually. It's usually only to plan out how things will work long term and, and what the best ethics are. And that doesn't always translate into life experience. It's the it's the most limited aspect of life experience, if you will. So uh, some people actually overvalue any of those. You can even overvalue the intrinsic dimension. You can overvalue feelings and experiences uh, to some extent. There is a way to centralize these and that's actually part of what the test actually is asking. If you look at your results, it'll show you your bias. So what the bias is, is where, think of it this way, like out of these dimensions, which ones do you appreciate and which ones do you not appreciate? What's your appreciation of them? Which ones, like think of it like attentiveness. Which ones do you attend to and which ones do you ignore? Make sense? So some people really attend to the systemic thinking parts of life. And some people don't. They don't care about what something is. <laughs> right? Some people really attend to the emotions or the intrinsic aspect. And some people, eh, I don't care how people feel, how I feel about it. I don't, I don't care about that, right? So what do you care about? What do you not care about? Um, that's one way to look at this. So where do you, look? do you look? Do you look at the positives of that particular dimension or do you look at the negatives of that particular dimension? Or do you see right in the middle and you can see kind of both, appreciate both? Which one do you pay attention to? Which one do you appreciate? Or do you not appreciate that dimension? Uh, there's two different ways to look at bias. Think of it this way. Part of bias is how much you give it attention or don't. Like, so if I have a positive bias, then I give it a lot more attention than it probably deserves. If I have a negative bias, I give it a lot less attention than it probably deserves. I ignore it. I undervalue that area. Or sometimes positive and negative could actually literally mean positive and negative. For instance, I, that particular dimension, I really love that dimension. I over appreciate it. Um, but also, I don't just appreciate the dimension, I look at the good sides of that dimension. Like I'm having a good experience in that particular dimension right now, whatever it is. My feelings, my, my actions, or my thoughts, right? Like the thoughts are real good right now. So I'm feeling good about that. I have a positive bias in that area. Does that make sense? Or that part of my life, that particular way of thinking, I might not feel very good about that. I might be failing in that area right now. So I could end up with, with a negative bias simply by virtue of, it's not even that I want to ignore that area. It's just, it doesn't feel good to look there. So I have a negative bias. 
right? Now, most of the time, those two things go along together. Ignoring an area and feeling bad about it usually are one in the same. Like, the reason I ignore it is because I don't feel very good about it. Does that make sense? So it's just like it's the same thing almost. But it could be one or the other, and we don't really know. And so it's something that you just have to talk to your client about or talk to your coach about if they're debriefing you on this, where your biases tend to be. So it's where you look. It's what are you paying attention or not to. It's how much do you appreciate that area or not. What is your desire? Do you really desire to focus on that or, not, or do you reject that area of your life? Like some people, like, they really desire, like, their doing. Like they're really an action-oriented person. I really desire to do more, to be more, to create more. And then other, some people really reject like their emotions, right? It's like, I don't want to feel what I feel, right? Or then maybe they reject other people's emotions. Like, hey, you shouldn't feel that, or I don't care that you feel that. Like they don't like it even, right? Have you ever met anybody like that? who is like overly positive or overly negative about a particular, they desire or reject a particular type of thought like this? That's what's happening. This is making sense to you probably because you see it all the time if you can kind of filter in the different people around you. And then again, this is also you and I. We all have this going on. So do we see what's right? Do we see what's missing? Where do we look? Do we look to the positive or negative? Do we look at all at that particular dimension? That's the bias aspect of this. So that said, I now uh, am going to give you an overview of what you'll actually experience in reading your assessment along with your coach or along with me. And coaches, if you're watching this, this is what I would also do after I share what I just shared with a client, which I don't need to do anymore if they watch this video. Um, I would actually take them through a map of the dimensions that we just talked about. So what did we just talk about? We talked about two worlds. We talked about the inner world and we talked about the outer world, right? Just in a different order. Inner over here, outer over here. If you go to your dimensional balance page, it's right at the end of your assessment, you're gonna see you know, something like, uh, you know, uh, self and the world or some worldview, self-view. It's basically outer world, inner world at the end of the day, right? The inner world is only you because that's what's inside you is you, right? What's outside of you is everything other than you, right? It's others and the world and things and people, places, etc. right? So I just say outer and inner uh, for simplicity. So we divide up our dimensional balance, which really is measuring clarity and bias for these three different dimensions in two different worlds, right? So you got one, two, three dimensions, one, two, three dimensions in one, two worlds. Two worlds, three dimensions in each. So we've got six items that you end up with, six, um, six different areas that we can score, six dimensions of thought that we divide this up to do. It's really three dimensions of thought that are focused on, this one's focused on the outside, this one's focused on the inside. Make sense? Okay, so knowing that you've got everything that we just talked about theoretically listed here and graphed here, we can actually start to read your clarity and we can start to read your bias. So the height of these bars, and they're different colors, they, they always change the color, so I just put everything in green here. But the height of the bar is your clarity level. So this is, think of this as clarity, right? Each of these are clarity levels. So remember, that's your aperture. That's how much light you can bring in. That's, how, that's your high resolution, low resolution picture. That's your focus or lack thereof in those areas. It's how much information you can gather versus how much you might miss. Okay, so if you're pretty low, like this, this self inner is it's pretty low here. Well, that particular mention for this person is a narrow myopic view. They don't see much in that area. They might just see like one emotion over and over and over again for themselves, right? Where this area, the practical, you know, extrinsic external, you know, that's really, really high. So they get everything and they, they see a lot in that area in terms of what they can do and how they could do it and stuff like that. Make sense? So how much you can even understand, how much you can even see, how much situational intelligence you have for that particular dimension of thinking, how much light you take in, how much detail you can appreciate and see, or how myopic and, and laser focused and kind of, you know, kind of out of your depth you are is measured in this particular 
uh, set of graphs. So it's pretty powerful stuff just to read the bars alone. You can see where you're clear and where you're not so clear. Now there is going to be a hashtag, or not, sorry, hashtag. There is going to be a hash mark, thinking about social media here. There's going to be a hash mark somewhere, sometimes with like some boxes and things like that. Basically what those hashes and, and boxes are, uh, are the national mean is where most people are, and then the standard deviations above and below. So if you're right in the middle of that, then you're kind of average in terms of everybody that's taken this. If you're above that range, whatever that range is, you're up here, uh, for that uh, above these little ranges that they give you, then that means you're in the top like 16% of the population for that particular uh, uh, particular dimension, which is pretty hot stuff. I mean, you're, you're basically clearer and see more than almost anybody else in that particular dimension. That's pretty fantastic. Gives you some real horsepower, at least in that dimension. If you're below that, that means you're in the bottom 16%, which means almost everybody else around you, chances are can see more, appreciate more, and has better kind of situational intelligence and clarity in that particular type of thinking, that soft skill, if you will. These aren't hard skills, by the way. This isn't math and English and geometry. This is soft thing, soft skills like uh, empathy and uh, resilience and uh, practical thinking and you know relating to others and self-evaluation. I mean, it's all this kind of like ephemeral stuff that makes the ultimate skills that we have that produce results or, or lack thereof in our life. That's why I said thinking overrides everything. So if your disc or your values are setting you in a direction, but this thinking you know, has tremendous capabilities and certain biases to cater to that, you could override your natural instinctual aspects of other things because this sets you off on a different journey because you can overthink, not overthink, you can outthink your own limitations. Does that make sense? This is why we really want to focus on this and understand this and appreciate this so we can get beyond ourselves, so to speak. I mean, this is still a part of us too, but this is the most advanced part of us. This is using our brain rather than just letting our DNA just run our lives or our emotions just run our lives. It's very, very helpful to know what this is. So that's your clarity level measured in this graph. Then we have your bias. And your bias in each area is measured in these arrows or these particular icons right next to your bars. And these arrows are going to be up arrows or down arrows, or sometimes you'll have double arrows like this or like a circle, just, a, just, a, just an O. And the up arrows just mean that's a positive or a bias or an overvaluating bias. If it's a down arrow, that, that's a negative bias or an undervaluating bias. You, you value that particular dimension on it lower than it really should be valued. So you could either overvalue a dimension of thought, like I overvalue thinking like that. You can undervalue that dimension of thought. I undervalue, like I should value that more, but I don't. Or you can have a neutral bias, uh, which is either two arrows coming together, or some, they used to have this with, a, with a, uh, just a hollow circle, which is basically just meant null or neutral, right? Now, down here below your graph, you'll also see these little gauges and these gauges also show you to what extent is your bias positive or negative so these little red usually i think they're red these red gauges these red needles if they're over to the left they're negative okay so if they're like this one is red line to the left it, it can't go any farther than than floored left this is a negative bias and it takes you all the way down to negative uh this is positive bias and it's moderately positive. This one's really positive bias, right? So it can show you, it can show you to what extent are you uh, over or undervaluing or positive or negative on that particular dimension. Does that make sense? So it's really easy kind of to see, you just read the height of your bar and you can see your gauge. You can really get a good sense of, you know, what's your clarity and bias level just sitting here looking at these different dimensions. Then it's just a question of which dimension are we looking at so we can read what does that mean. That is an introduction to your actual graphs themselves. Now what we're going to do for the rest of this preface to your live debrief, if you're going to do that, is we're going to go through from left to right these different dimensions and what different levels of clarity and different biases actually mean uh, to you individually 
Now I'm not going to read the overall patterns. That's something that you or that I or your coach will do, you know, one on one when we're working together live. But I can at least give you individual readings on every one of these, so you can follow along and you can have a really good sense of what you know high practical thinking with a negative bias actually means as well. We're not just going to read this particular graph. We're going to read, you know, basically any graph and how that might uh, play out. So for that purpose, I have a special object that I will show you in the slides, but I also have it right here with me. This is what we call our axiology cube. Uh, they don't, I don't even think they make these anymore, but uh, this cube shows each dimension of thought, and then it gives you axes. In fact, I'll go to this next page in the past your uh, demonstration in the dimensional balance page. You'll see one face of this cube in, uh, in right here on the screen right here. So what you're looking at is empathy. And for empathy, you can see 10 to zero, that means high to low. And then you can also see, uh, if you go left and right, you can see negative to positive. That means undervaluation, over overvaluation, negative bias, positive bias, if you will. So we can see an axis, like a four quadrants of where your clarity level is, high or low, or your bias is, high or, or, or positive or negative. So if you're low with a negative bias, you would, of course, focus on the lower left. If you're high with a negative bias, you'd look at your upper left, and on and on and on. Okay, now we're looking to look at every one of these and how I might read those and then what our axiology cubes tells us as well so you can uh, get a sense of what do your what do your what do your graphs mean in the uh, aggregate of these two particular measures? And I'm going to give you some more typical patterns that's beyond what this dimensional uh, balance axiology cube reading actually tells me. But this is a great cliff note cheat sheet for us to just read what's the uh, quintessential reading on that particular score. But I'm going to describe these as we go. So let's start with external focus. Again, we're going to start with this outer world. Uh, and we're going to start with the intrinsic dimension that we talked about, that human brain, right? The, the poetic and emotional brain. And so this is the intrinsic relator. This is where empathy comes from because we're, we're having emotional intelligence about the outside world, meaning that we can empathize, right? That's what empathy is. It's appreciating the outside world. So if this is high, like if you have really high clarity in your empathy, uh, then you actually psychically understand and appreciate how other people feel. Like you can get them already, okay? Now, uh, one coach ha actually has said that it actually may make you seem disinterested in somebody's feelings because you understand them so well that you don't need to talk about it. So I actually, one time I took this, I got a 10 out of 10 on the empathy uh, you know, which is, I think, pretty natural for a coach or some counselor or something like that who really kind of is, they're already pretty psychic. And, you know, I think with some people in my life, I sometimes come off as, you know, very, um, you know, kind of cold and, and uncaring. And it's like, well, yeah, but I just know. I already know how you feel. I already, I already can feel you. It's like, I don't need to talk about it. We don't need to talk about this or that or how, what you went through. Of course, a lot of people feel they need to do that, right? Even if I understand it, they got to go through it to know that I understand. They got to experience that. And so I think that's understandable. It's like, you know, some people who have such high empathy may actually seem disinterested in what other people feel because they know other people's feelings too easily. Also, by the way, this could be too much. Like you can feel someone too much. Like you feel them so much that you cry with them rather than help them to stop crying, right? So uh, th this can also create challenges, um, other challenges other than just uh, seemingly being disinterested in, in feelings. Ultimately, you feel what other people feel or you at least know what they're feeling. And that is a pretty important aspect of, uh, of this, of having high clarity for this area. Uh, and by the way, it's very useful to know what other people are feeling uh, as well, as you might imagine. Now, if you're low clarity in this area, you are, you basically don't 
like understand people, <laughs> right? It's like, I don't get them, you know, I don't understand. That may make you more motivated to try to understand them. Sometimes people don't even want you to understand them. They just want you to try, right, uh, to understand them. So in that case, that actually might help, like we just talked about. But somebody who's very low clarity in this area might seem a bit dense or obtuse or even insensitive, again, to other people's feelings. Like, But they're not insensitive because they know what they are. They're insensitive because or they seem insensitive because they really don't understand. They're just like, I didn't know you felt that way. And they just like, you know, like that stuff just bounces off of them like a pinball, right? They just don't get it, right? So if you have somebody in your life that seems cold, they seem disinterested, they seem disconnected from you, and it's not like anything's wrong, but they just seem that way, is it because they understand you too well? Or is it because they don't understand you well enough? because it could be one or the other. It might be important in life to understand and appreciate why somebody's operating a way that we perceive them to be operating rather than just that we don't like that they're doing that. That could tell us a lot more about what's really going on. Maybe we really have to help them understand or maybe they already do and we just know that they do so we don't even worry about whether they are attending to our feelings anymore because they know our feelings so well. So. Uh, that's uh, clarity levels on this uh, on this side of things. Now let's talk bias. If you have a positive bias with your uh, empathetic outlook, as they like to say, you are going to be overly attentive to feelings. This is where you could become codependent or overly enabling, like because somebody feels afraid and you're like, oh, okay, I understand you're afraid. Maybe you have to help somebody get past their fear. But you may not do that very successfully if you are um, uh, positive bias here because you're just like catering to their feelings, right? You're an enabler ultimately. Like maybe they feel like drinking and doing drugs every night. Are you gonna cater to that too, right? So this, is, this could be a problem to have too much of a bias towards, you know, like over empathizing, if you will, over feeling somebody basically. Uh, now, the positive thing about having a positive bias is that you will probably spend time working with people on their feelings. You'll probably be a pretty good counselor, somebody who's very supportive, who's there to you know, kind of be an emotional crutch for people or at least a uh, shoulder, shoulder to cry on because you value those feelings so much. Now, a negative, on a negative bias in the, uh, with empathy is going to be somebody who's just less interested in how you feel, right? The less interest in other people's feelings and the and the feelings about it. Like, by the way, this could be very helpful. Like, that's Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs couldn't care less what people felt about his decision to change the product line. He just did it because he knew it was the right thing. It was unpopular, and he was successful as a result of it a lot of times, even though a lot of people hated his guts for it, right? So he just made his decision. You know, so that could be actually good to have a negative bias in empathy sometimes because we, again, we now we're undervaluing feelings which can have us be l maybe a little insensitive but make very powerful decisions that are not based upon feelings. Sometimes feelings don't push us in the right direction. Intuition can actually be misleading sometimes, what we call our kind of gut instinct, our feelings leading us in one direction or another. There's all sorts of feelings that you have that will hurt you if you follow them, right? We go against our feelings all the time. So negative helps, p helps us to push people against what their feelings are. If you are a really amazing influencer, a really good marketer, a really good salesperson, chances are you have a negative bias with your empathy. Like you do understand how they feel, but you don't overvalue it. You wanna get them past their feelings. That's what you get paid for, is to influence someone past their limitations, their limiting feelings, if you will or the feelings that stop them from at least doing what you'd like them to do, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for them. So somebody who's negative bias here would ha maybe be a little less trusting. They're not in attentive to feelings. They might be a bit more de detached. They might even become a bit sociopathic. You know, obviously that's a continuum as well. That's why we call this axiology. It's continuum on an axis. So let's go ahead and read our, uh, our cube here. So let's say you're really high in empathy with a positive bias. And I've already described a little bit about what that might look like. This person prefers personal relationships. They want relationships that are all about feeling each other, not about just getting things done, right? Professional relationships aren't about us all patting each other on the back all the time. They're about, let's get it done. I don't care how you feel about it sometimes, right? So this person is going to be more personable, more personal rather than professional. 
right? In fact, they might fee seem unprofessional at times because they're so feeling everything rather than just getting the job done, getting to it. The desire to be close and helpful makes sense. Cheerful and friendly, desire to please or accommodate. This is the enabler part. Like I'm a people pleaser. I need to cater to your feelings. Overly tolerant. We talked about that before, blind to others' faults because we're so busy. We can appreciate how somebody uh, feels and their feelings might be the basis of their fault. So then we overappreciate the fault. We don't even identify it as a fault, right? Um, now, let's go over to the negative bias. So if you had high empathy, in other words, high clarity level, you have a big aperture. You could really take in all the feelings that are around you. Uh, you're very empathetic, but you have a negative bias. Here, this is, this is a, a really, really important group. Understanding of others, but not as trusting. Like, I know you, but I don't really trust you. <laughs> like, because I don't care how you feel about this. Prefers professional relationships. Now we've got, hey, I appreciate feelings, but, well, actually, no, I understand feelings, but I don't appreciate them. I want to be more professional. I don't care about your feelings. Sensitive to others, like I can sense what you feel, but I'm willing to assert my own will over others, meaning that's the manipulator aspect of the negative bias of the empathy. It's like that's the influencer aspect. It's like I know how you feel, but I'm willing to assert my will. I'm willing to influence you to politically move you to my point of view, to get you into action. Uh, willing to manipulate others to achieve goals as well. So think of this as the manipulator. Whether that's good or bad manipulation, that's up to the person wielding this ability, right? Uh, so, and ultimately, a lot of times you got to take the good with the bad. All right, let's move on to lower clarity levels. So if you have low clarity, low empathy, like you don't really understand how people feel, you don't really get it, you're, you're, you can maybe see one, I understand they're afraid, but they don't really understand anything else. If you talk to a lot of like really young kids, like five-year-olds and six-year-olds, and you ask them, hey, do you know how Sally would feel if you did that to them? Like they hit each other. They, they're just little monsters, right? They are not because they're bad people, right? It's because they can't empathize because they don't have this empathy skill yet. They don't, even, they don't even understand how somebody else might feel, right? So they got to work at that or they're just, they just uh, like at a certain age, they, like literally you can't even fathom that there's another point of view. You know, they've literally scientifically tested this to see that, hey, that three-year-old, they don't even realize that there's thoughts that are other than their thoughts, <laughs> right? Much less feelings that are different than theirs that they should appreciate, right? So if you're really low in empathy, clarity level of empathy, you just don't get it. You know, you're like that seven-year-old that just thinks about themselves, right? Or if you're trying to think about others, you can't really get it. Like you just, just, you're, you're just not that skilled and intelligent when it comes to emotions of other people. So what if you were low clarity with empathy with a positive bias? Like, and really low there is probably like uh, below seven, let's say, like if you're in the sixes or below. Um, even like the low sevens are probably, I'd probably defer to calling that low, right? Because I think the national mean is like just below eight uh, or around eight. So difficulty understanding others. May be confused by others' actions more easily. Like they don't even know why people are doing what they do optimistic towards people they're just confused by them like they like people but they don't understand they don't get people right they're blind to others true faults um i'm not sure why that's true faults versus just others faults but okay fine uh and uh might, might overcompensate in social interactions with others uh, very seldom, by the way, do I see somebody with, I, I don't, I can't remember the last time I saw somebody with a low empathy with a positive bias. I, I just, I think if somebody really cares how people feels, it's not, it's, it's not really not that hard to understand it, right? It takes a little bit of work and you're probably going to be relatively high in your empathy. So may overcompensate in social interactions with others, just meaning like they, like, there's a lot of short subjects where they talk, where, where they present this, like somebody realized somebody was mad but then they overcompensate, they give them, you know, they buy them a house, right? They do something really kind of stupid. They stupidly try to try to interact with them to make up for the, the anger, right? And, uh, and it's, and again, it's like, an, it's obtuse, right? They're overcompensating in these social interactions because they don't understand the feeling 
but they do care. They're like, hey, I really care how you feel. I don't know why you feel what you feel, uh, but I'm just going to do this, right? They, in fact, they might make it worse sometimes. Like sometimes somebody will say, uh, I can't, I'm trying to think about the story uh, that's a good demonstration of this, but like I saw that you were mad that one of your pets died, so I killed all your pets, <laughs> right? So then you never have to worry about your pets dying again. Right? It's like, okay, that was dumb. <laughs> right? They did it for good reason, right? but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Right? That's this when it comes to human interactions. All right, now let's talk about negative uh, bias with a low empathy. Now, this is actually relatively common. People that don't know how other people feel and they don't even care. So poor understanding or appreciation for others. Like, I don't understand you and I don't appreciate you. Emotional distance or fear of getting too close. Aggressive or user tendencies. It's like, I'm just here to use you for what you're good for because I don't care about how you feel. And I don't even understand how you feel anyway. So why I'm not even going to bother to try, right? At least if you got a positive bias, you're trying to help how somebody feels. Insensitive and tactless, meaning you're going to say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Uh, people talk about this in the world of comedy. Like when 9-11 happened, like 20 years ago now, uh, comedians like a few days after started making jokes about 9-11 and everybody got mad and they said that's too soon because they were being tactless and insensitive to all the people that had lost loved ones and all the death and the destruction and everything and so that was insensitive and tactless even though they were probably making a probably a decent joke right now, five years later, 10 years later, or now, somebody makes a joke about that. It's not insensitive because that time has passed and they know that those feelings are no longer as fresh for the people that that impacts who are still around, right? So the, the, there, there's all sorts of examples of insensitive and tactless behavior that is literally just based on low understanding of how people feel or just not caring because the bias is negative. Not or, and again, this doesn't mean you don't care about people, just to have you a negative bias and empathy. It means you don't care about feelings. Like feelings just don't seem to matter to you. Like you just don't, that part of your mind, the part that tries to figure out feelings, you just don't like using that part of your mind. Now there could be a variety of reasons why that's the case. Maybe there's bad feelings around you, you don't want to focus on it. You know, people grow up in some families that are abusive, it's like they, have a negative bias, they just don't want to think about feelings because everybody feels like crap, right? Or they really just, you know, it's not important to them. They think there's other things that are matter more in life than that. They think that value in life is elsewhere. Now, again, we have our perfect picture of value that this is the most valuable. The people that don't make this the most valuable and make it second or third to other things, they have a negative bias here. Hopefully that makes sense. So possibly even hostile or provocative, meaning they're going to do things that will provoke n negative emotions. People get mad. People get sad. They're, ho they're, they're hostile. Like, like they don't care about the other feelings. Uh, you know, nowadays on social media, you know, people like to film, you know, like the Karens or like the people that go to these stores and complain to the manager and, you know, are really great on people. And sometimes they even get violent. And now we're making fun of them, right? Because we have social media to do that with. Well, you know, these people are relatively hostile and provocative, right? They probably have a low empathy for the people that work there and the, everything else. They're just thinking about their own feelings, really. Or they don't care about that. Like, I know how you feel, but I don't care how you feel, right? I want to see the manager, right? So that is the, uh, uh, the empathy side, the empathetic outlook, as we like to say. So let's move on to the extrinsic external dimension, what we like to call practical thinking. Why? Because that's the extrin is extrinsic dimension. When it comes to the external world, we're thinking practically about things. How do we catch the prey? How do we make the money? How do we get the nice car or the nice husband or wife? Right? How do we get the best situation um, and the action, the hand in it, the physical action or the the uh, yeah the progress through the physicality of life to get the best situation and evaluate good better best and the continuum of practical value so that's practical thinking otherwise known as extrinsic external 
uh, focus, the outside world, the extrinsic aspects of the outside world, not the intrinsic aspect now, the extrinsic. So this is the doer, the practical thinker. When this is high, when the clarity on practical thinking is high, uh, we see all the ways to get results, right? We see every little bit of it. We're clear on them, and we have a big aperture. It lets all the possibilities in. We have a lot of options, basically. Uh, when we are uh, low in, ex in this extrinsic e external, we're low in the practical thinking, uh, we really see maybe one way to get a result, maybe two. We're kind of myopic. Or maybe we just don't see how to get results at all. Like it's like it's all blurry. It's like I don't really get this. It's kind of all, it you know we get muddled, if you will. If you ever talk to a coworker or somebody in business and they're like, you know, I really want to get that, but I don't know how. And you say, well, what about this? You just did this the other day. I don't know. And they're just like, I don't know is everything. Like they live in this kind of confusion land when it comes to producing measurable results, like acting on things. They probably have a low clarity in their practical thinking, or at least they're acting like it, if you will. There could be other reasons for that, obviously. So this is the doer part of us, if you will. So that's a more myopic view, a singular view, or a blurry view of how to get results. Uh, what about biases? Like if you have a positive bias in the practical thinking area, then you're overly attentive to practical actions. Like you're all, like you might, be a, like, be a workaholic, right? You're like overly working to produce the practical result. He's like, this is going to produce better results. I have to do it, right? Um, I have a family member who they get up in the morning and they have to work. They can never take the day off. They have to be useful. They feel guilty if they're not. Why? Because they're overly attentive to practical thinking. They have a positive bias in their practical thinking. They think they're a human doing. They're not a human being. They're a human doing. They're all about doing stuff, right? And if they're not doing they're worthless. Why? Because this is part of the value of life, but they overvalue this value. They think this is more important than it really is, the practicalities. Make sense? So they overvalue this. So they're overly attentive to practicalities, to strategies, to actions. It's all about getting the result, the best result possible. And it's not about how people feel about it. That was Steve Jobs, by the way. He was super practical. Don't do that. Do this. People don't like it. I don't care. They undervalued the emotions. And he overvalued the practicalities. I mean, you look, watch his, uh, you know, biographies and all that. They talk about some of the family issues. I mean, you know, I don't know how true any of this is, frankly, because I didn't know Steve. But, you know, they depict him as somebody who was insensitive to family, his family's feelings, his daughter's feelings, and what was going on with his family. And he kind of divorced them and went to work because work was where he could produce a practical result and go to the sky with it. That was the most practical thing to do, right? But, you know, later in life, it's like, oh my gosh, my, my personal life is in, sham in shambles, right? Like, look at, the, look at the destruction I've created or the, the, uh, uh, the distance I have between the, me and the people I love, right? And I suppose, like, a lot of his story is that he repaired a lot of that. But the point of the matter is, you, you, it's a, I think it's a good representation, good kind of parable around somebody who's overly practical and under empathetic and they don't see the fallout of that so they're really great really successful uh you know the science of achievement is amazing but their art of fulfillment sucks right they're unfulfilled and the people around them are unfulfilled but they're still real successful that's positive bias with practical thinking overly attending to that overworking over planning over sensitized to practicalities and winning chess uh, chess games all the time you know uh i remember watching a uh documentary on magnus carlson as the world chess champion for many years and he's in an interview with a person right this person's interviewing him you know he's like smiling and talking to the interviewer and then you know he's sometimes you look at magnus he's just got this blank look on his face he's like this you know <laughs> and he started getting that blank look on his face and the interview is like hey uh magnus hi i'm here like we're in a relationship right now like we are hanging out right and they asked him they're like magnus what what do you, th you like, think about chess all day and he's like yeah pretty much <laughs> and and then the interviewer probably intuitive interviewer said uh what are you thinking about right now and he's like yeah i was actually thinking about some chess problems 
he was thinking about the practical way to win in a chess problem well he was divorced from the feelings of those around him to make sense probably part of what makes him a good chess player but could create challenges in the rest of his life for him to overvalue that area make sense i don't know i don't know him i don't know his life but it's very possible and i think again it kind of epitomizes the uh, the upsides and downsides of overly practical thinking. So let's say you have um, a negative bias in this area. You're under attentive or cautious around practical actions and strategies. Like you're you're not really interested in the practicalities or you're kind of negative about like, I don't know if this is going to work. You know, you're kind of iffy about it, right? Now, just to clarify, I'm not sure if I clarify this or not if you are low in clarity on practical thinking you may still see some ways to get results but you're probably only going to see a few like w like i see one way to get this result and if that doesn't work i'm screwed versus i remember i was partnered with somebody who's made a million dollars a year in my industry he was, did very well and he was kind of a guru of the people around him so one of his one of his Lieutenants talked to me one day and this guy said, you know, the thing about Mark that I notice is that he always finds a different way to get there. He'll get there somehow. If he goes north and then he's blocked, he goes south. If he goes south and he's blocked, he'll go west. He'll weasel his way through to get the result. He sees every way to get the results. He had a very high practical thinking. Probably had a positive bias with it as well. So let's look at the uh, axiology cube our little cheat sheet for these so again if you're above eight on practical thinking you're probably what i would call high if you're in the low sevens or below i would probably err on the side of saying that you're low practical thinking clarity level right a uh, less clear and obviously you could be a lot higher a lot lower and then that's even more uh it, it i'd be more confident that these reads are correct you take it with a grain of salt if you're kind of in the middle. A lot of people fall in the middle, by the way. So th sometimes this doesn't completely help us uh, understand and clarify exactly what it's trying to tell us. So let's start with high practical thinking with a positive bias. So somebody who's really sees every all the practical ways to get something, and they really value that. They're overly attentive to it. They're steady. They stick with it. They kind of a stick with it attitude. They're persistent and resourceful. They're creative. They're timely, and they live in the now. Practical thinking is about now, not about someday maybe, right? So you can get a sense of what that's like. Now, what if you have high practical thinking but a negative bias? This area, you might be frustrated. Like you know how to get there, but it's not working yet. So feels hindered in achieving results or goals. Frustration with results. They're reluctant to fully engage in projects due to past experiences. Like I know how to get there, but I don't want to do it. I have a client that I uh, w started working with about, I don't know, seven, eight months ago. And he made tens of millions of dollars in his business, but then he lost some money and he had some real failures. And he's like, I, I, I don't like, I need to rise from the ashes, but I don't, I don't even want to do it. I said, why do you want you want to do it? He's like, because it is so much pain. There's so much pain. It's so, I mean, there's just, I've, I've failed so much. I'm like, look, you're multimillionaire. What are you talking about failing your success? He didn't see the success. He saw his failure. And he was feeling hindered. He was reluctant to fully engage due to past stuff. He was caught up. He was stuck in the past, his past pain. For practical things, it didn't work out. He didn't win the game, right? So contains high amounts of unrealized potential, can be ju judgmental when stressed. That one always a little confused me, but you can imagine like if somebody's got a little stressed about the results, they can start making, you know, hyper judgments and start getting a little flippant, let's say. Uh, start being less sensitive let's put it that way so let's move on now to the negative or not negative but the lower scores if you're low clarity on practical thinking but a positive bias uh, the lower right you may not exercise common sense <laughs> you may have poor spatial reasoning you might be lousy at sports or something a little clumsy not mechanically inclined not detail oriented uh, or not great at following directions in other words you can't produce a result very easily right uh, so you might want to because you care about the practicalities you have a positive bias you overvalue that but you just you know you're like you really like basketball but you suck at basketball think of it that way 
Uh, okay, moving on to the negative bias in uh, with a uh, low clarity, reluctant to engage in work, poor understanding of the work process, can be social socially awkward when stressed, and they're not an implementer. So if you hire somebody on your team and they're in this category, I hope that they don't have to do anything like to really produce a real measurable result. They're going to have challenges, right? So let's go ahead and move on to the systemic external, which we like to call it systems judgment. There's a lot of other ways that we'll say it, but systemic thinking, structured thinking, black and white thinking on the outside world. This is quite, think of this as like your rule book and your definition, like your dictionary for the outside world. I see what the world is. I see what it's not. I see all the equations. I see the geometry. I see everything all down to the code. Uh, you ever remember that, uh, that scene in the Matrix where suddenly Neo could see that the world he was living in was really just computer code and he could see the code. Like he could see the system behind all the feelings and the craziness and all that stuff. He had good systems judgment at the time, I guess, right? So that's the systems judgment, the systemic thinking. So structured logical thinking. If you're high on your clarity, you can see the entire structure. You see the matrix, as they say. Uh, you can see very wide view of all of the structures, the rules, the laws, the policies, the procedures, the systems of the world, the boxes that people live in. You have a clear view of structure. Uh, you can appreciate policy, procedure, budget, models, concepts, rules, ideology, laws, commandments, <laughs> right? So if you're really high systems judgment and you are you know, a Christian preacher, you get the commandments, like you really get it. Somebody can really, you could get in the nit nitty gritty of the commandments and remember them and appreciate what they uh, what the meaning is or what the logic is behind them and all that kind of stuff you're going to deliver that really really well uh, if you run a business and you're really high systemic you appreciate the policies procedures of the business or the laws in your industry let's say you know like a like a good cop who you know always knows whether you're going over the speed limit they know exactly where to draw that line right that's the systemic uh, judgment that's really really clear uh, and this is, as I think I mentioned before, it's a double-edged sword. Like it can be positive to see those boxes. It can also be challenging because somebody could be an either or. Like you either broke the law or you didn't. You either followed policy or you didn't. You either you either are uh, a sinner or you're not, right? Or you could instead uh, some people have both and thinking. So it's either or. Like I'm very rigid. It's this or it's that. Or it could be both and thinking like, well, you did this, but you also did that. So it's really both, right? So now you see lots of nuance and gray area, right? So, uh, so it's somebody's binary thinker, like a computer, zeros and ones, and there's nothing in between. Or do they see the whole spectrum of what's possible. Systems judgment, systems thinkers are going to be more zeros and ones. So there's some downside to that as well. Uh, so, like, if you had a dad that's a systems thinker, dad would always say, that, well, my dad would always say, there is a right and wrong way to do things, and you did it wrong, or you did it right. You know, like, he would celebrate me if I did something according to his beliefs and his rules, his systems, and if I didn't do it right, he would have done it. He was like, well, you were never taught right. <laughs> Your mom didn't teach you the right way to do it, right? And he was, you know, very, very intense when it came to that, right? Uh, now, on the other hand, like I look at my mother, she's the opposite. It's like she's like, oh, whatever. I just feel like doing it this way this time, right? And she's a little bit more cavalier and flipping about how to do it. She's not a high heavy-duty systems thinker. She's a little bit blurrier in this area, or she has a negative bias, probably both. So hopefully, you get the sense of what that is. Like um, my my wife is uh, not heavily systemic in her thinking. And bedtime for my daughter is whenever it's time to go, whenever we get around to it, you know? So like, I'm much more of a systems thinker. I'm like, you know what? Nine o'clock is bedtime or eight o'clock is bedtime or 9.30, you got to start going to bed, right? And so they might be eating dinner at, at 9.30 sometimes. And it's like, uh, what the hell happened? You know, she's not as big on systems thinking. Right. I'll give you another example. I'm talking about my wife. Uh, in in her business, she's got a very successful uh, 
uh, restoration business and real estate business and she's grown it from just from nothing and she sometimes struggles with management and her growth and gets a little overwhelmed and I say well do you have a system for that and she's like what are you talking about <laughs> I was like well do you have a management system for when your people do it right or wrong do you have a reward system for that do you have a system for bringing in customers when somebody says they need a job done like what happens she's like well I don't know I just talk to them I do whatever <laughs> right Everything for her is like gray area everywhere, right? Which actually, by the way, is one, part of the reason why people love her is because people just really feel taken care of. They feel empathized with by her. Like she really cares, but she also stumbles sometimes in her business when it comes to systems because she's not as much of a systems thinker. Makes sense? So there's an upside to systems thinking. There's a downside to systems thinking. And you just want to identify those and see it in yourself or your client if you're uh, working with your client on this side. So uh, let's see. Anyway, if you're low, let's say you're blurry on systems, you miss most of the structure. You're myopic on, you only pick one structure to focus on and you don't, you don't, you're blind to the rest. Or you're blurry about it, like you don't really get structure at all. Like nothing, there is no structure. There's just all the gray areas for you, right? Everything's gray. Let's talk about bias here. So if you have a positive bias for systems judgment, your external systemic, uh, dimension you're overly attentive to systems you're attached to systems you're probably going to be overly rigid you're going to be very structured and you're going to be very rules attentive and rules based that's good that could be good or bad depending on what context negative bias let's say you're negative bias in your systems judgment even if you're high under attentive to structure you're detached from structure you don't care about it you're not interested in the rules or the definitions or what things are or what they're not you might be more flexible, but you also might be more of a maverick, which could be, again, a good or a bad thing, depending on the situation. Some businesses, they're such mavericks, they break all the rules and they reinvent an industry. Some businesses break rules and they die because the rule mattered to keeping you alive, right? So uh, those are the biases when it comes to systems judgment. Now let's read our, our uh, Cliff Notes, our cube for systems judgment so uh, if you're high systems judgment with a positive bias, that means, again, overall, that you are going to be very rules-driven. You're going to be structure-heavy. You need structure as well. Like if you don't have it, you're going to feel lost. And you see structure very clearly, but you need it more than you probably should. So let's read the, the key. Compliance with established rules or authority. So you'll be very good within any box that somebody puts you in. You're accepting of rules. You have conformity with law uh, and authority. You enjoy structure, like I said, an order over chaos and lack of structure. Chaotic businesses, chaotic families, chaotic situations, you do not do well. Okay, You're a team player, meaning if the team says this is the way the structure needs to be. the team. By the way, teams are structures. So if you're on a team, then you're going to appreciate the structure of the team. You identify yourself with the company, the group, the structure, right? You're a part of that in your world, okay? Now, what if you have a high systems judgment? In other words, you really understand structure, but you have a negative bias. Well, here you're going to be more independent. You understand the order, but you're really not obsessed with having it. You're willing to bend the rules. You don't really like being managed. You're a little bit more of a maverick. Um, and uh, you may feel under recognized by the company like hey i do my, i do it my way but they don't like that way and i know it and i know they don't like that uh interprets existing rules in their own way in other words i'm gonna i i'm a master of rules but i'm gonna manipulate the rules for my purposes because i don't care about the rules outside of me as much does that make sense that's a real nuanced piece is that you really are a genius when it comes to rules, but you're like, you're going to MacGyver those rules into your own so you can bend and break them to your advantage. All right. What if you have low systems judgment? A lot of people have lower, they're pretty blurry on systems. So if you have a positive bias, you're willing to conform. Like you, you appreciate structure. You just don't understand it, right? So you're willing to conform to authority, but you're unclear as to their dictates or vision at the present time. Like, I don't know what these people want. I don't get it. Requiring further explanation of rules or directives, right? You like you don't understand. You need more help with it. And you probably want it. Fuzzy on what the rules are, but willing to learn them and comply. Like, hey, I want to follow these rules. I don't understand them. Help me. Blind faith in established order is possible. In other words, they might really have faith that 
this order is the right way to do things. Now, what if you're negative and you're really cloudy on systems judgment? Like you don't have a big aperture there. You don't bring in much, but you also don't care. Here, you're going to be confrontational, rebellious, unaware of the rules, and probably not interested in learning them, dislikes a lot of structure and order, a true free spirit or maverick. You got somebody like this on your team, they're not going to follow any of your rules and dictates. You pretty much uh, guarantee that. All right, now let's move on to the internal dimensions, the inner world. So we're starting with uh, what we used to call self-esteem, uh, self-empathy, uh, self-concept. I know they have a different word for it right now, but uh, this is really how you understand your own feelings, your inner empathy for yourself, right? So this is the intrinsic internal dimension. This is you relating within yourself. How do I relate to myself? Self-empathy, self-care, self-esteem. If you are high in this area, you understand your own feelings. If you're low in this area, you don't get your feelings. Like you're, like you might know how other people feel, but I don't, you don't know how you feel about things. Like you're not really clear on your own feelings. If you are, uh, if you see your own feelings and value clearly, you're probably going to be pretty high in this area, right? I really get how I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I appreciate why I matter and why my own feelings matter, and I appreciate what my feelings are. If you are low in this area, you can't see your feelings. You can't see what, you, what your own kind of esteem for yourself could be, right? So you have a lower self-esteem, lower uh, uh, self-empathy. What about bias? If I have a positive bias in my uh, uh, self-esteem, my uh, you know, intrinsic internal, uh, then I'm going to be overly attentive to my own needs and feelings, right? So I'm going to be more self-attached. I'm going to overvalue how I feel about things. I could be overly sensitive about certain things. I might be enabling myself. I might be attached to myself, if you will, my own issues. Uh, if you, like, everybody looks at themselves in their mirror. Everybody's interested in themselves. But if you overdo that, if you're overly self-examining, well, and you probably have positive bias in this area. Uh, and usually people with a positive bias here like how they feel. They like what they see when they look in the mirror, so to speak. They, when they feel themselves, they, you know, they feel good uh, because their, their feelings are probably positive. So they want to spend more time feeling their feelings. They're just kind of fat and happy, if you will. Now, what about the negative? If you have a negative bias within this self-esteem or you know, self-concept area, uh, you're going to be less attentive to your own needs and feelings. You're going to be detached from yourself, self-detached, if you will. You're going to look now. In this case, you'll look at yourself in the mirror less, probably, or appreciate yourself less. You're going to be in. You're going to have less self-examination uh, of your own feelings, at least. Or you just don't like what you see. You don't like what the feelings are. When like some people have really their feelings are messed up inside, and so they don't look there, and that's why they're negative bias. Basically, you care less or you don't feel good when you do face that. And when you have a negative bias, especially if you're really low in this area, it's almost like you can never do enough. You could do a bunch of stuff, you could become a bunch of stuff, you can think a bunch of things, but it still doesn't help you feel what you wanna feel because the area of feeling is just not clear to you or it's undervalued to you. You'll never be enough, you always need more and more and more, and you'll never be satisfied. Why? Because you never feel satisfied because you don't have that self-esteem or that self-concept to uh, bring that to the table. So let's look at uh, if your self-esteem, uh, self-reflection, uh, et cetera, is high uh, with a positive bias, you're going to have a strong ego. You're going to be kind of self-centered, probably. You dislike criticism because you, know, you just think about how you feel and how other people feel. And you have a strong internal belief in yourself. What if you have a negative bias, but you're really high in self-esteem? Usually high in self-esteem is like anything above seven because the internals are a little lower. Uh, you have a good ego, but you feel unfinished in your journey. Like I know who I am, I know how I feel, but I don't feel that great yet. They have inner strength. You see undeveloped potential in yourself. Uh, you're motivated to improve, uh, meaning like, okay, I just don't feel right yet, but I know how I feel and I really want to fix my feelings. Uh, they see the key to their development in whichever, whichever other internal dimension has a positive bias. Meaning, if you're negative in self, 
but you're positive with direction, that's very common, then you think the key is figuring out your own direction in life, finding yourself, then you'll feel better about yourself. Make sense? All right, let's go to low self-esteem. This is very common. Uh, when I first took this, my self-esteem was like five, so you know, I'm, I'm with you on this if you're you know, below a seven. So let's say you're lower, lower self-esteem, lower self-concept, uh, uh, it's, it's lower than seven, but you have a positive bias. Well, somebody an unrealistic view of yourself, but you're happy with it. In other words, you don't really know your own feelings, but you're pretty, you're feeling pretty good about it. Anyway, uh, not very motivated to grow anymore as a person, a pig in the mud. That's what I was saying before. It's like fat and happy sense of happiness with current place in life. They do not realistically understand their own strengths and weaknesses, but they do uh, believe that they do. They think they know their feelings better than they do. Make sense? Now, if you have, this is much more common, lower self-esteem with a negative bias, self-depreciation, feeling unfulfilled, possibly depressive, no real sense of self-worth, likely they see their self-worth through the eyes of others. So this is not a fun one to look at. If you're under a seven, you have a negative bias and self-esteem, this should describe some aspects of you and again you could take it with a grain of salt but you know this is what I saw when I first saw this score for myself and what it really is telling us is that your sense of self-esteem your sense of worth your sense of your own feelings um, you don't really have a sense of it and it doesn't feel very good chances are and you're looking outside of you usually or in some other dimension to get that handled and the problem with that is it never will if you have lower self-esteem and you just don't feel good, trying to fix it by making a million dollars or making everybody else happy or finding your perfect dream job, usually, I mean, sometimes that'll work because some people just decide when that happens, I'll feel better. And then they do, lo and behold. But most of the time, this follows you along that path and you become more successful, more successful, more successful, more of a winner, more of a winner, please people more, please people more, better, better, better and yet you still see, feel the same as when you, as the way you felt 20 years ago when you started that journey. And the reason is because you're not attending to yourself. You're not caring enough or focusing enough on your own feelings. And if you just did that, you'd be in a different life. Even if the external part of your life or other parts of your life didn't really change that much. When I saw this and I realized that I needed to take care of myself and my own feelings more and attend to it more, and just figure it out more. I started meditating. I started like doing these kind of, you know, I like myself kind of affirmations, and things like that. Like six months later, I'd making way more money and I was way happier and I had a way, way more confidence. So that's what's possible out of just identifying this. It's not a fun thing to see, but it's worth it if you're willing to do something about that score. Well, let's move on to role awareness. So this is the extrinsic internal kind of the doer, this is role clarity. How clear on you are you on your usefulness, your extrinsic usefulness with, within yourself so you can actually produce a result in the world? What's your role? How do you fit in with the rest of the world, if you will? What do I do and how do I do it is the big question you're either answering or not with this. If you're not very clear, you can't answer the question very well. Am I useful now? Can I produce a result today? Is it, or is it just like a concept of who I might be in the future? So this is about the now. What do I do? How do I do it? Some people really know what they do well and how they do it well. And other people have no clue what they do well. And you see them signing up for, you know, like uh, uh, auditions for singing and they sing horribly. And then everybody makes fun of them and like, I'm really that good. And they like really have no clue that they're not very good. Right. So you'll see this around you. Sometimes people that think they're really good and they're not or think they're not good and they are. Right. And then there's other people that have a really good fine tuned ability to appreciate what they do well and what they don't. And they have great role awareness. They understand their role and what their role is not and how useful they can be and how useful they're not. So if you're really high in your clarity in this area, you really get what your role is. You know what you do well. You clearly understand that what you do well and especially what you don't do well as well. Like, so you could see where you should draw the line. And, you know, this kind of person would say, I know my strengths, I know li my limitations. They're usually going to be good at staying in the zone, being in the now, producing the result, and kicking ass and taking names, basically. Now, if they're lower clarity in this area, you're lower clarity in this area, 
uh, you have no idea what you do well or what you don't do well. Or you're maybe myopic. You see one thing you do well or one thing you don't do well. It's like, I know I'm not good at that, but you don't really get the rest of it. You don't see your strengths and weaknesses in the rest of that picture in terms of productive, useful. Like, you don't see how you're useful. Let's put it that way. Uh, and they don't understand their own talent or you don't understand your own lack of talent as well. This kind of person might say something like, I, I just do whatever I can. It's like, I just, I just do whatever I can do. And <clears throat> a lot of time uh, they will uh, put m too much time towards the wrong job and they don't even know that they're wasting away doing something they shouldn't be doing. What about biases in role awareness? If you have a positive bias with a role awareness, you are overly attracted to your role and what you do well, right? You're like, your whole thing is like, this is my role, I do this well, I'm just gonna stick to it. Uh, and you really, or you're just enjoying your role, you're like you really like it. If you have a negative bias in the role awareness area, then usually it means you're frustrated with your role, like you're not happy doing what you're doing. Um, or you just don't care about what you do, like you don't care about knowing your role, <laughs> you know, you just show up and do whatever, and uh, you might feel bad or disappointed or undervalue what you do well. So let's check our little uh, axiology cube here for role awareness. Uh, if you're really high role awareness with positive bias, you have a keen understanding of your roles in life, you're socially well adjusted, you receive uh, personal achievement from your roles, and you see your primary role is well suited for you. And it's probably a good sign that you, they have, that you have a good balance between work and personal life. If you are still high role awareness, but you have a negative bias, undervaluation, you understand your role, but you're not sure if this is the right one. Like you know what you're there to do, but you're not sure if that's a good fit for you. You do not find complete reward, personal reward in your role. Now, have you ever been in a, a role where you did it really well, but you kind of hated it? Like it didn't, wasn't rewarding for you? that's you probably have negative bias in this area. You're frustrated with your role. Early indicator of role confusion or dissatisfaction. Like you're starting to, things are starting to unravel at work or unravel with your role. Now, if you have a lower role awareness, you're below the seven area usually, but you, let's say you have a positive bias, you're, you have a disconnect with your role, but you're opti optimistic about correcting it. Meaning like, hey, I, I'm gonna figure this out. Like I, I know I'm gonna, f I don't know what my role is, but I'm gonna find it. Like you want to spend time figuring out your role. You want to look at it. You're unclear about your role, but you're eager and willing to work through it and engage again. Will cause some anxiety until questions about role are answered. Okay, so you're not like clear on it, but you're not like, you're okay with that. Like you're gonna work it out, but you might still struggle a little bit with it, but it's not that bad. It's a positive bias. Now, what if you're low with a negative bias here? That usually means that you don't have a job. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. But you could be in between jobs or you're seeking a different role. A lot of times when I see, because I help people with the hiring processes in their organizations, uh, we will run an assessment and they'll have a negative, low negative role awareness. And they'll say, well, isn't that a problem? I say, no, they're not working for you yet. Unless their role that you're hiring them for is the same role that they've been in. This is a, maybe even a good thing because hell, it just shows that they shouldn't be doing their job that they're doing right now. And maybe they should be, do, be doing what you are gonna hire them to do. Uh, they have a role conflict. Maybe they have conflicts within the roles in their life, dissatisfaction or questions with their role. So that is uh, our little cheat sheet on role awareness. Finally, self-direction. I like to call this self-definition. This is systemic internal the system of you, right? How you define yourself. This is the thinker inside, right? The self-definition, self-direction. A lot of times we call this self-direction because it's like how we think indicates what the future looks like. Just because you're thinking it doesn't mean it's now, but it's like it's a plan, it's an idea, it's an ideal, right? It's a vision, if you will. And so this is our vision of ourselves in the future our idealistic vision of ourselves a lot of times. How well do I understand my goals? How well do I understand my vision, my future, and myself as I define myself, my beliefs about who I am? I like to also call this your identity concept. Like, do you have a clear identity or do you have a blurry identity? Clear identity is I know who I am, I know who I'm not. That means you probably also know where you're going in life. 
if you have a foggy identity or a blurry identity, it's like, I don't know who I am. Like, who am I? I'm lost. There are people who wander around in life. They go around in circles. Nothing wrong with that. It's just they're not going to get anywhere. A lot of times they're, not, they're wandering and not getting anywhere because they don't know who they are. They don't know what the future brings. They don't know what their goals or vision are because they just have a really blurry self-direction. They haven't defined themselves clearly or they don't want to. So think of this as like the internal backbone, the internal compass for you or your client if you're the coach here listening. All right, so uh, if you're high in self-direction, you have a really clear image of you. You know who you are, you know who you're not. Uh, you have a clear vision, direction, and self-concept. You have a good, solid philosophy. Your concept of yourself and your future is well understood. If you're low in this area, you're probably a little lost. Kind of like, who am I? I don't know where I'm going in life. You're probably lost in terms of goals and vision. Uh, you're a bit of a vagabond or a wanderer. You're kind of more of a question than you are an answer. It's like, uh, you know, you're, you're, lear you're learning about yourself maybe, or you're just like, you just don't know. Okay. So um, let's talk bias. So if you have a positive bias in self-direction, that means you actually are excited about your future or you like at least thinking about who you are, whether you know who you are or not. If you have a negative bias, you usually undervalue thinking about yourself and your own definition of you, or you have a negative view of the future, let's say, like, or you don't want to think about the future. So positive, going back to positive, a couple notes here, overly attentive to self-concept and future idealistic view. It's like my future view, I'm, I'm over, I live in the future. I live in fantasy world, even though it's clear for me, maybe. Uh, and it does, this is because you're positive bias doesn't mean you're clear. Negative bias, under attentive or negative attention to your self concept and future idealistic view, meaning you don't look at that in a positive way or you are not very attentive to it uh, at the end of the deal. I like, I can't see the future. I feel like I'm going in circles. That would be the kind of the conversation you might think about there. So let's read our final key here. If you're high self-direction, like above seven, and you have a positive bias, you have a clear sense of direction, strong self-identity with future version of self, self-confident, resilient, you can weather the storms, you're self-assured, and you might even be stubborn. You have a backbone, but you might be a little rigid in terms of who you think you are and who you're not. You can't be as much of a chameleon. What if you're also very clear and high self-direction above a seven, but you have a negative bias? You, that, in that case, you're probably questioning your ability to reach future goals, you may see your future as more dreams to be reached than a life to be realized. Like you don't really believe in it. Question, you might question the accuracy of your current life plan, and, but you might be actually very flexible and open to suggestions. You're not as stubborn in that case because you're more of a negative bias there. What if you have a low self-direction? Like you're, you're under a seven, but a positive bias. Well, you'll have questions about your current path in life, but you're confident you'll find the answers. You want to think about it. You enjoy thinking about who you are and where you're going. You're self-guided as opposed to being guided by others. Your future might be a little cloudy. You're not sure what it is, but you're confident you'll clear it up. And you place importance on having a plan and the rules to achieve it. You want to define yourself and who you are and where you're going, right? It's, it's the binary you. Is that my I zero or am I a one? Now, if you're low self-direction, clarity, but a negative bias, well, you're going to have a lack of drive towards your future. You're not going to be as hungry to live your concept of yourself because you don't have it, uh, and you don't really want to think about it. You might be myopic or nearsighted. You might not look to the future very much. You might more live in the now. You might have many questions about your direction in life and your future. You, there might be some fear reluctance to see what, where your future lies. I, I talked to a client the other day, and she said, I have no future, right? And I was like, why don't you have a future? She's like, oh, I'm old. She's 52 years old, <laughs> you know, or 57, 59, something. She's in her 50s. It's like you have like decades left of your life if you don't like kill yourself with some, you know, with drinking or something, right? And she's like, oh, I have no future. She has a negative bias and a low self-direction. She just doesn't see it. So she's reluctant to actually imagine what that is. Positive situational, oh, sorry, positive situational code Sorry, I'll say that again. Possible situational code of ethics. 
So it's possible that you might, you know, not have much of a backbone. You're not stubborn, but you're also a chameleon. You just went in Rome, you do as the Romans do because you don't have any rules for yourself, so to speak. Or you just don't care and you don't care about those rules because you're negative bias. Does that make sense? All right. So we covered a lot of ground here on uh, reading these six different aspects of uh, what makes you think. So really look at these. If you need to go back and kind of listen to some of the coding here, uh, you know, please, please do that. I mean, there's a lot of other little patterns that I will or your coach will go over with you in, in these individual areas or in combinations of all of them together as you debrief your assessment. You want to really try to get a sense of how you think, what are your biases, where, you're cl where are you clear and where are you not clear, and get a sense of how that's impacting your life. How might you need to change how you think? Because these are just patterns. Your brain is very plastic. You could alter this. You may not alter your disc. You might not alter your instinctual behavior. You might, over time, alter your values, but it takes a long time. This six months, you can radically change your clarity levels in an area. You can shift your bias. You decide to think differently. So no matter where your scores are, you can move up. You know, I didn't start with a 10 out of 10 empathy. You know, I, like I worked on that over decades to get to that point where I could take this test and actually achieve that 9.8, 9.9. Uh, and ultimately, at one point, I had a 10. Um, you know, my self-esteem started really, really low with a negative bias much higher now this is not through the roof but you know i'm more focused on other people i'm more of an empathetic type you know so that's probably still a pattern for me that i could still work on right being a little bit more selfish maybe self-interested in my own my own emotions but i know it and i can choose to think through that and do exercises and plans and personal growth processes and uh, to get me where i want to go in my thinking and my thinking turns into things in my life. You know, as uh, Napoleon Hill said in Think and Grow Rich, thoughts are things. They're not exactly things, but they turn into things. So you look at your life, you don't like your life, change your thoughts, your life over time will change. This is the patterns, your patterns of thoughts, measured in one particular way at least, that have guided you to this moment in your destiny. What destiny do you want now? What thoughts, patterns, biases, and clarity levels, where do you need to get more clear? Where do you need to get smarter, more intelligent, more adept? Where do you need to zoom in and be more you know, laser focused? Where do you need to change your bias or your outlook on certain things, on, on these different dimensions, if you will? And then how are you gonna do that? These are questions that you may not be able to answer just by me asking them. But when we debrief this, or when you debrief this with your coach, those are gonna be the questions that we'll start to answer. We could create a battle plan for you and again, that's why working with a coach is so huge because this becomes your trajectory in life that changes your life in a way that's miraculous. And I don't, want, I don't use that term miracle lightly because fact is that how many people do this? How many people see this? And how many people, even after they see it, actually do anything about changing it? It's slim to none. So if you work with your coach or you work with your clients, if you're learning this debriefing process to, to change that thinking pattern, a miracle will happen. And that's defined by the unanticipated, the unexpected and the unimaginable. It's unimaginable for most people to change their thinking. It's unimaginable for most of us around us to see somebody that actually changed their thinking and changed their entire life. But it does happen from time to time and you could be that person to do it with a little bit of help from your coach and the assessment results. Uh, and look, six months later, you could retake this and you could see different results here. Like this is one that you really can change the clarity and the bias on, whereas values and, and behaviors, a lot of times that stuff doesn't change for decades, if at all. So that said, if you have any questions, let me know. Get with your coach. It's time to debrief this now that you have the kind of the theory behind it and I look forward to working with you uh, if we're going to work together on this uh, when we debrief your attributes index, your Hartman value profile, your PTSI. Take care until then.